Is the royal family relevant today? The Windsors? In spite of their longevity, they are no strangers to scandal. Who could forget Charles and Diana's acrimonious divorce? The mysterious circumstances surrounding Diana's death, Prince Andrew's recent sex scandal, coupled with Harry choosing to live in another country. Do we really need them? Nobody comes to England for the weather. I think they're a great asset to have for the country. Brings in tourism. Don't really need the monarchy, so... <laughs> I think it needs to be reformed. I actually quite like the royal family, so in the States they're really popular. We don't have anything like that there, so we kind of like to see what you guys are doing here. People flock here by the thousands to see the royal family. I like Harry and Meghan. The gossip doesn't hurt either. I'm not very keen on them, to be honest. It's part of this society. It's also part of the way the democracy works. I watched The Crown uh, on Netflix. Whenever a newspaper editor wanted a royal story, you can bet the name of Miss Penny Juna was never far from their lips. And indeed, she has become the godmother of royal biographers and correspondents. She was the first person to write about Charles and Diana. She followed up with two books on the Prince of Wales, and then recently, a book on both William and Harry. When I first started writing about the royal family, which was oof, over 35 years ago now, I, I didn't write about them because I was a royalist or a monarchist. I wrote about them because I was asked to. A publisher rang me up and said, would I write a biography of Diana? I was a journalist at the time, fantastic opportunity. I would have written about anybody. So my view on the royal family has changed quite a lot over the years. And I have become, having written about them, studied them, and followed them all over the world. I have become much more of a royalist. The senior royals, I think, are extraordinary people who have such a dedication to duty, a selfless dedication, that it's pretty awe-inspiring. You know, Harry is, he's a very funny guy and he's very charming and he's very impulsive as well. They were a magical couple and when they married, everyone was overjoyed. She was beautiful, she was glamorous, she was of mixed race, which was a great thing. You know, a huge plus for the royal family to have a mixed race member. It was representative of a, of a lot of people in this country. The monarchy must always be relevant to the people in the country, otherwise it will lose its, its reason for being. The press loved her, people loved her. Everywhere she went, they were a golden couple. And for a while it looked as though she and Harry might actually eclipse William and Kate. By contrast, they were beginning to look a bit staid and dull. But my goodness, how staid and dull looks good these days. Looking at Meghan, who is an American and was, by all regards, somewhat of a commoner, like, it seems very difficult. Just that sort of lifestyle that they have to uphold, like, even though you want to do great things, like, that is something that's really difficult for you to live with, I think. I think she's very brave. Yeah, I think she's entitled to her privacy. I am not too sure if she was quite aware of what she's walking into. <laughs> Personally, I don't think it's Harry. I think it's uh, Meghan who's probably suggesting they go over there. I don't know. I think history will tell how long 
they stay over there for. I think Harry might come back. I think Americans in general got more invested in the royal family. I mean, we always sort of enjoy the pageantry from afar, but I think people got more invested in the royal family when Meghan married in, and of course she was very meaningful for a lot of people, and that's important. I think it's very sad that Harry and Meghan have stepped down from royal duties. I think it's very sad that they're opting to live in Canada. They obviously want to get out of the public eye in terms of the public duties or all public duties, but what they do have is quite a successful brand there. So I, I can see them going to America or to Canada and um, doing very well. The fact that he's left the royal family, is, that takes some bottle. I guess I've got a bit of respect for him for doing that. They completely left everything behind and they're going to do their own life. They don't want anything from the royal family and they're doing their own living, which is great. Well, it hasn't been very clear about why they've wanted to move. That's the whole problem, and that's why there's still decisions that have to be made. I don't see any reason that they shouldn't do it if they want to do that. They were treated horrifically by, I think, the British media and tabloid media over here. I think it's justified in a sense. I think maybe um, it may be a bit more Meghan than him. I think maybe her not coming from that kind of uh, background, it's quite hard for her to adjust and maybe that's been a tipping point for him to kind of do what's right for his wife as well. Not sure about his comments where he said he's going to go through a transitional period of being able to stand on his own two feet financially. I think he could probably do that straight away. We have lost them. I mean, I would hope it's only temporary. I think the press have always been very intrusive in his life. But, I mean, people in the public eye always have a dual-sided sword of how they deal with the press. The UK press is, in some like scenarios, just vile, really, the amount of pressure and harassment that they put on to celeb not just the royal family, celebrities in general. All of them will be hounded by the press. And I'm sure that memory of his mother at such a young age and all you ever hear is about the press. And we could all see it wherever she went, there were thousands of them. And of course it's going to happen to Meghan. I don't think any of us really know why Harry and Meghan have gone. They talked about negative publicity, that Meghan said famously that it's not enough just to survive, you have to thrive. My sort of private theory is that Meghan had undergone a huge number of big life changes in a very short space of time. She had left her country, she'd left her friends and support network, she'd left her family, she'd given up her job, she'd come to Britain, she'd married into an extraordinary family, she'd taken on a new job, and she had a baby. All of this in under two years. And I think she was struggling. The British press have a very nasty habit of building characters up, putting them on a pedestal, and then knocking them off it again. When they were out doing their job, they got fantastic publicity. It was what the negative publicity came from were things like the baby shower when Meghan flew across to New York for a hugely expensive party. The British are not good about flashing money around. The Americans are much, I mean, I think there's a culture clash. Meghan didn't understand the subtleties of, of the British monarchy, apart from anything else, let alone the British culture. And she was stuck out in the country. They'd left London. The nearest Starbucks was a good five minute drive away. She'd never lived in the country before, I don't think. So I just think she was miserable and Harry was desperate to do something to make her happy. If a man goes, a man goes to work every morning, 
all right, gets up and whatever. What's he doing that for? His family, all right? Just because he's a royal doesn't mean he like, doesn't want to protect his family any less. I think it's justified, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of trauma, especially for a child. That affects a person, especially in the choices that they make as an adult. And it doesn't shock me whatsoever that he'd want to prevent something like that happening. Not saying that it would, but it probably has passed his mind. All right, so look, if you was, if you was here and there was like gun shooting going on over there and you was with your family, the first thing you'd want to do is take your family out of that situation. It was horrific what like the tabloid media and Daily Mail and everyone was writing about her because it was just completely unfair to put her in a position like that because it was it was pretty racist. I mean, it's it's very difficult being a white woman to pick up on on what a black woman would regard as racism. I always had a little bit of a problem uh, with Harry meeting somebody that was Hollywood. Don't have the, the, the race uh, issue. Uh, I don't think that's a problem. But just that somebody that um, is an actress, not probably used to the, the prior nature of the press in terms of uh, the royal family, they cope with it differently. I think in America, and, and obviously she finds it very intrusive. Obviously, the British tabloids are notorious, even more so in some cases than the American tabloids. But I think there's a certain deference that maybe exist in Britain that simply won't exist in, a, in Canada or the US if that's, I think that's where they intend to end up. I think it's understandable, but I wonder if practically it will have the effect that he thinks it will have. I mean, considering Brexit and everything that's happened in the last couple of years and what we've been dealing with like over here. In the media especially, there's an overtly like racist tone about like everything, which I think if they made the move to Canada, which I think is probably less over there. So I think they'll probably be treated less harshly than what has been going on here for the last couple of years anyways. I personally don't feel that the coverage, by and large, I mean, there have been one or two unpleasant pieces written and, you know, one or two incidents which were clearly racist and unpleasant. But I think overall, the coverage has not been racist. I think the coverage has been typical of the British media and their habit of building somebody up and putting them on a pedestal only to knock them off it again. She was put onto that pedestal. She was the, the golden girl who'd arrived in the royal family. She was coming in as a breath of fresh air. She was bringing her mixed race with her, which, which was great for the family. Their wedding was spectacular and there was so much affection for both of them. It's a cliche, but um, America and Britain are divided by, they're two countries divided by a common language. We really are very different, I think. And the royal family is a strange institution and we expect them to behave in a particular way, which is sort of illogical, the way we... We like them to be showy, we like them to wear lovely clothes, but we don't want them to be wearing clothes that are too expensive. We want them to peer out of the sky in helicopters and turn up in Rolls Royces, but if they get above themselves, we, we, we slap them down. Without having been brought up in this country, I don't see how anyone can really easily fit in. And Meghan coming in, I think, absolutely didn't understand that. And why should she? She thought it was absolutely fine to go hugging people. It is absolutely fine to go hugging people, but we don't expect it of, our, of the Queen. If the Queen started to hug, we'd be horrified. So that was where I think the, the negative sort of publicity started to come in. And some of it, I'm sure, has been very hurtful. I mean, you know, anyone who, who is in the public eye gets negative publicity. You always do. There's no one, no one who escapes it. Who knows what actually goes on in that relationship between Harry and Meghan? I think it's probably her that's caused that. I think she's, she lives, she's lived in Canada. I think she's called the shots, really. It's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, any, any, any marriage is going to be, it's a, a two equal parts, it should be. I think he's, he's followed what she wants, but I think he's going to miss, he's going to miss the limelight because after all, you know, he's quite big in the UK as a, a sort of 
ex-playboy, etc. So I think a lot of it is down to her. I think he's very much his own person and he's always had his own way about going things, but I think he's met the person that he wants to be with and he's uh, respecting her opinions as well and taking them into account. Megan is undoubtedly a very strong woman. She was a successful actress. She's had, she had a difficult beginning. She had, it came from a broken family. She's a strong, independent woman. Harry is probably quite malleable and I would think she certainly does call the shots in the family. Whether she has manipulated him, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess at all. I mean, isn't that like the classic story of the shrew, like, you know, contra like controlling her man? I mean, I mean, I'm sure he has a bit more brains than that to just be controlled by like someone. I mean, come on. He certainly seems to be very much in love with her. On the other hand, he's, I think the, the clip that's been out on YouTube of Prince Harry at a Disney reception talking to the head man, I suspect that was more Harry being a bit cheeky. I mean, I feel like that's completely blown out of proportion because you can just take a second of a clip from anywhere and just be like, he's trying to be like a shill for his wife. But I think it's conversation. I mean, I, like I said, I work in the film and TV industry and I sometimes go and joke around, like, you know, with on networking events about like, oh, yeah, hey, hire me. I wouldn't think that Megan had said, you go and ask, you know, ask him, tell him that I do voiceovers. I think it's, you know, absolutely on the cards that he might just, as a joke, say, you do know my wife's, you know, up for work, don't you? There's been a lot of talk about the British taxpayer should not pay for their, for Harry and Meghan's security if they are not working as members of the family. Well, of course, if you're not doing your job, you shouldn't be paid for it. I live in an area where the stabbings are going on in London, so it's North London. I had someone actually being arrested with a knife. Why is it happening? Why are teenagers dying left, right and centre? It's because there's no money for security. And then you read that the royal family is taking in millions to have their security for only two people and a baby. And then you think, so is, are their lives better than those teenagers and these people that are actually killing each other and dying? So why couldn't they just, it's not a good thing for them to, to have the money here. Yeah, I pay taxes like everyone else. I want to be able to walk around and be safe and I have wants to see people that they are safe. He's the, the Queen's uh, grandson. So I, I would think the security is still going to be something like what it was. But um, whether we should or not, I don't know. Well, I mean, if he's now denounced his role then obviously the British taxpayer should not continue paying for him or her. But I mean, if he's going to continue any kind of role, then depending on what that role is, then obviously he may have some of these costs covered because, I mean, there is beyond the duty also important roles that the royals play with regard to promoting British culture, British industry, so if he's going to be involved in any of those trade trips of any kind, then that's, you know, a governmental or a duty for the country and obviously he should be paid for that accordingly. I don't think we should be paying for them. They've got enough money and they can earn a lot of money. I mean, she could go back to doing acting, couldn't she? <laughs> I think that needs to be tapered down. I don't think you could switch off the tap immediately. Yes, I suppose you don't get paid if you're not doing a job. If I said to my boss, yeah, that's fine, I don't, um, I'm not going to do what I'm paid for, so why would she pay me? I agree with that. I don't think uh, the taxpayers should be funding, especially things like the security or anything like that, because they're no longer a part of the royal family. I think that should be their responsibility. Personally, I think if they remove themselves from the royal family, then they should be creating their own kind of funds to support their lifestyle. I don't really think the British taxpayer should pay for someone who's not in the royal family and who wants to obviously go, go somewhere else and do their own thing. So I think, yeah, in that respect, I wouldn't want to be funding their lifestyle. I understand people's irritation that we should be funding this couple who have walked away from 
what arguably, you know, we, we see as their duty. On the other hand, Harry didn't ask to be born into the royal family. It is only because he is a member of the royal family, a senior member, the Queen's grandson, that he is a potential target. He's also a target because he served in Afghanistan. I think, like it or not, the British taxpayer does have to pay back for that service. The brothers are two very, they've been close, close as can be all their lives and very much relied on one another. They had a difficult childhood and they clung to each other. But they are very different characters. Obviously, it's no like secret that Harry and William's relationship has changed over the recent years. I'd be surprised if it was any great, if there was any great rift. I mean, I don't, it's all speculation, isn't it? We, the only things we hear about it through the media, and I'm sure the media sort of exaggerate it and play on things just to sell papers. Any of those differences of opinion has directly caused a rift between two brothers. Blood is always thicker than water, even if it runs blue as it does with them. William is very controlling and considered. He thinks things through and make, then makes a decision. Harry flies by the seat of his pants. He's very instinctive. I think what was happening is that they were working together for the same charity, and, and the charity, their foundation, was based on their areas of interest, and they have similar areas of interest. And I think that probably Harry was getting frustrated because maybe something that he wanted to do, William had already taken ownership. I think that's less about, I mean, obviously family plays into it because they are a family, but I think that's less about family in the traditional sense and more about duty to taxpayers and where the legitimacy of monarchy comes from. You know, I, I think if a brother decided to give up a job and move to Canada. In any other circumstance, it would just be a personal thing. This is definitely not, and I think you're seeing that manifest in discussions. I admire what William and Kate do. I think they tow the royal line very well and will continue to do so. I think uh, he's perfect, he's second in line now, is he, for, for the throne? And I, I guess Harry's the spare one anyway, so he's, he's, he's more likely to go and um, sort out a career for himself outside of the, the, the royal spotlight, but being able to use that powerful brand that they have to do very well, I would have thought. I think it's a real shame that, you know, there is a, there is a rift there. Um, you know, you, you could put it down to either, really. I think it does seem like they're not very close as a unit, as, as both couples were previously. So I think they always have seemed very, very close. I don't see that there's a personal rift between them. Maybe there's something else around that that's kind of shifted their opinion. I actually think that the press make far more out of these things than um, I'm sure the two brothers sat down, had an agreement and said, if you do that, I'll do this, happy days. It doesn't work like the press make it seem like it works, believe me. There's a hierarchy within the family and there's a hierarchy between the boys as well. And William is the, the more senior of them. And I think that Harry at times found that a little bit frustrating. So I think there were niggles and inevitably, you know, when one brother marries and starts to have a family, th their focus turns more onto their family rather than their unmarried brother. So I think the ground was shifting in their relationship. Then Meghan arrived and my understanding is that William thought that Harry was moving a bit too quickly and Harry, I think, really took against that. And I think that that was the point at which the, the relationship seriously became unhinged. And then the two women, I mean, they're just poles apart. They're so different. So there wasn't a, an immediate rapport there. No family is perfect, right? So it's like every family is going to have issues and ups and downs. And I guess it's, it's pretty awful for them that it's now a public, you know, it's a matter of public opinion. If they have issues, it's fine. It's such a tragedy that this relationship has, has gone sour because it was so close. And, it, you know, people in, in years gone by, they were, their advisors, their, their private secretaries were sort of envisaging a future where William became king, 
that Harry would be his wingman. He would be there alongside him. Yes, I think it's probably an issue of everything, whether it's power, uh, you know, obviously power dynamics. But then I also feel like it might also be personal issues between... It could be like loads of different things. I don't think a rift is necessarily because of one thing in particular. Years ago, there, I think, was a real possibility that Harry might throw in the towel, step back from being a member of the royal family, from being a working member of the royal family, disappear to Africa or somewhere where he started his charity, Centre Bali. Harry was a troubled child who grew into a troubled teenager and always struggled with being royal. He was referred to always as the spare, even by his mother. He was the one who was less clever than his brother, less good looking than his brother, less important than his brother. And he, you know, all of this bubbled away inside him. <clears throat> then he went into the army and he discovered he had a talent for flying Apache helicopters. It was something that he could do superbly well. He really was the top of the top. It gave him a, a new confidence in himself that he had never had before. He found that he had an ability, because of who he was, to raise awareness, to raise money, to make things happen. Had he been playing Harry Wales, that Invictus Games could never ever have been done in the time frame. Harry had the idea, he stole it from America, but he had the idea, he made it in, into an international event, not unlike the Olympics, which took eight years to come to fruition. Harry managed to get that off the ground in less than a year, the first Invictus Games. And he did it because he was HRH, Prince Harry who was able to use his charm and his title to persuade people to help him and to make things happen. My favourite is William. I think the William and Kate, I think they're perfect the way they deal with their life and uh, I think Kate has really slotted into it. And hopefully in a very short period of time he will become the king and I think they'll make an excellent king and queen. I feel like he will just because I feel like his opinions are more modern and like up to date and stuff but we will give Charles like, a chance just because he's waited so long for it and I feel, 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 feel like he deserves like the chance. Yes, I think he will and I think he's, he does everything correctly. I think he, 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 he plays the part very well and I think his wife will do a very good role as well as, uh, as a queen. <laughs> I think that's a really messy situation and I think he got off probably easier than he should have. It seems like a vile, vile man really. Yeah, because he's a royal, like he's sort of untouchable in a sort of way. Oh, I think he'd at least be talking to the FBI. I think definitely there is a... And also because it's Prince Andrew and he's had other issues, I think there's a certain, oh well it's him being him again and there's nothing really we can do about it but we don't want to hear from him anymore. And so the best they can do is kind of cut him off or remove him from royal duties. Basically anyone else, there would be at least an investigation. I don't think that Andrew has necessarily been treated any differently because he's a member of the royal family. The American prosecutors seem to be, or the American lawyers, certainly seem to be accusing him of all sorts of things and demanding that he go and face the FBI and, and an investigation. So I, I, you know, they're not exactly sweeping him under the carpet. I think with that, he's definitely kept the wrong company um, there. And I think his uh, Newsnight interview that he did was a complete disaster. Until Andrew gave that interview to Emily Maitlis, he was a bit part player in a story that was really about Jeffrey Epstein. Well, I remember yeah. seeing the programme that night, and I, it, like what was said in the papers, complete car crash. It was really hard to watch. And I think it shows that people like Andrew are just totally out of touch with what people think. You know, they, they, he probably thought just turning up and saying this, that and the other, would, it would all go away. And he made it far worse than it ever was. I mean, bad enough, but you know, he, he made a, a bad situation a lot worse. I think that's a much 
bigger deal than was probably let on here especially I don't know um, how it was covered specifically in UK media but US media in particular I think it kind of got swept under the rug I think it should have been more honestly from like my perspective even just as like a woman I think that he should have gotten a little bit more than a slap on the wrist I think he should cooperate with the US uh, authorities because that came out in the paper I remember reading that that he wasn't cooperating with the FBI and I think he should because I think it is like very serious allegations and they should be looked into. Unfortunately he's, he's made some mistakes. There are so many other people that have made mistakes who are in the limelight and they get away with it, They're called heroes. But he, because of the situation, is not classified as a hero. He's made a couple of mistakes. I don't think he, he should step down at the moment, no. I mean, a good judge of people is who they associate with and the people that he's been proven to associate with have proven to be very nasty people, so yeah. I mean, my view about the whole thing is that Andrew brought this whole thing on himself. Yes, he'd been around, but I'm sure there are many other people who had been around and he was being accused of, of sleeping with the underage girl. The only reason his name kept coming up was because he was royal. My view is that he ought to go to America and talk to the FBI or whoever it is that wants his witness statement. I don't know if it's appropriate, but I think it's about the best they can do without risking, again, the legitimacy of the monarchy. I don't think that... It, I think that's very lenient. I think he should be... like. I mean, I think there should also be uh, investigations over here regarding those charges because, I mean, he shouldn't be protected just because he's a public figurehead. I think, yeah, he is pretty much untouchable because he's a royal. If he was anyone else, he most definitely would have been tried in a court of law. I think it's highly likely he did sleep with Virginia Gufre Roberts. Whether he knew she was underage is a completely different matter. And in fact, in this country, it, it, there was nothing illegal because she was, she was not underage in this country. So, but, but I think, you know, he definitely spent time with Epstein. Epstein sounds like the most hideous character. He was definitely abusing a, a lot of young girls. And, you know, justice needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a problem anywhere in the world if you're in a position of power. I mean, look at the Harvey uh, Weinstein, Weinstein <laughs> case. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty obvious that if you're in a position of power and if you have money, you can pretty much get away with anything. I don't think we'll see Prince Andrew back uh, as, a, as a working member of the royal family. I think he has absolutely hold himself, you know, shot himself in the foot. But I don't think he'll be a great loss. Not many people really know what he did. I mean, most of what people know him for is being Randy Andy. He, he had a string of sort of dodgy friends in foreign countries. He has been a bit of an embarrassment to the royal family, I would suggest, for, for some years. I would think, I mean, we're looking at William being king possibly, you know, maybe 20 or 30 years ahead. I think he is looking, he's shaping up really well. There was a time when it looked as though Harry and Meghan might eclipse him and Kate. They seemed to be far more exciting and glamorous and go-getting and modern. And then they blotted their copybook and they've now gone. William and Kate, I think, have had a resurgence in popularity and we now look at them and think, actually, quite conservative and a little bit dull and a bit dependable is really good because that's what they are. They are I mean, rather like the Queen. The Queen has never been a fantastic personality because Monarchy is all about unifying the country. That's what monarchy should, is for and that's what it should do. And if you've got a very big personality, some people will love that per personality and some people will hate that personality. 
That's the nature of human beings. If you have a very bland character as your head of state, then there's less to like and less to dislike. The Queen has mastered that. Privately, she's, she's a much more exciting, interesting individual, but the, the, what she presents to the public has always been very vanilla, and she's never expressed any strong opinions on anything. William has modelled himself, is modelling himself, on his grandmother, I would suggest. I mean, privately, he's a much more exciting man than the one we see, but I think he is modern enough, but not too modern. He is, his heart is very clearly in the right place. He has experienced the real world even more than his father has managed to do. He understands what monarchy is about and he understands how he can be effective as a member of the royal family, as a future king. And I think he will actually probably be a very, a very extraordinary king. He has very good ideas. Kate is a superb support to him. I mean, the, the, one of the problems with Charles and Diana was that Diana became a superstar and she, she ran with that. And she outshone Charles. Charles was the one who's going to be king. He was the one who the attention should have been on. Camilla has, has proved to be a brilliant wife in as much as she just supports Charles and holds him up for people to see. Kate is doing exactly the same with, with William. She has not allowed herself the, the publicity, if you like, to go to her head. When she first appeared, you know, she was, she, the press would have done exactly to her what they did to, to Diana. They would have turned her into a superstar as well. I think they might very well have done that with Meghan. A, the role of a royal wife is to support, a royal consort is to support. The Duke of Edinburgh has always supported the Queen. He could have been a big personality himself. He could have, uh, you know, he was a, a big guy with big ideas, a great modernizer, but he allowed the Queen to shine. William and Kate, I think, will replicate the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. The member of the royal family that I've written most about is the Prince of Wales. I am very fond of him, if I had to choose my favourite member. I mean, the Queen is extraordinary, but I actually don't know her quite as well. I have written about her, but not in such depth. The Prince of Wales is my sort of age. I've grown up with him, grown up observing him, and I have huge admiration for him. He's a shy man, fundamentally, who's had to to be out there and to meet strangers on a daily basis and deliver speeches to audiences of hundreds of thousands. It's something which might not naturally have, he would have chosen to do. But he has absolutely dedicated himself to duty. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and he has spent his life giving back. I mean, he, Obviously, has developed over the years. I mean, he's been a very long-serving Prince of Wales and, you know, heir to the throne. So, obviously, not only has he developed as a person, but developed in his roles within society, but also taken over quite a lot of the uh, monarch's roles from his mother. So, I mean, he certainly has developed. And I love Charles, and I think it's very sad that he's had to wait all this time, but quite rightly... I think the Queen should go on uh, until the end of her days. As far as what he says about trimming the royal family, this is what a lot of um, English have been crying out for. They call them hangers on, people that uh, are getting money from us that uh, we don't seem to think that they're doing anything. Maybe a few years ago, they, they thought that Charles was, was a little bit, uh, a bit wacky, had, had some strange ideas about talking to plants and all those sort of things. A few years ago, people were saying, you know, or well, William, uh, hopefully William will take over from the Queen. There's something, and I think most people now like, Charles to have a go. Charles suffered enormously from, from his failed marriage. The people 
the country, the world probably, were divided in their loyalty. Some people adored Diana and felt that she was wronged by the Prince of Wales. Other people thought that she was flawed and that the marriage was a, was a, a wreck. But the, the people were, were very divided in their views about Charles at that time. And a lot of people blamed him for the collapse of the marriage and ultimately for her death. And as a result, he's been deeply, deeply unpopular, principally because his marriage failed. The antagonism towards him in Britain has been because of his failed marriage. His reputation since that era, which is now 22, 23 years ago, when Diana died, his reputation has recovered. I think when he married Camilla, life became better for him in every way. She re rehabilitated him. She made him a very much happier, more confident man. When people could see the real Camilla and realize what sort of a woman she was, when Diana had been alive, Diana called her a Rottweiler and a marriage wrecker. And it was his relationship with her that had fundamentally caused problems in the marriage. That and her illness, of course. I mean, the, the, there are many reasons why that marriage didn't work. It was, it was not a good match. But people blamed Charles and his relationship with Camilla. Once they were married, people could see that Camilla was actually a really nice woman who supported Charles in, in a very dedicated way. And I think because of her and how he has been since he's been married to her, the reputation of both of them has gone up and up and up. Had he become king a year after Diana died, I think there would have been, that could have been very difficult for him. I think the lapse in time and him continuing solidly with good work and with Camilla demonstrating that she also is a hard worker who's just there to support him, not after any titles herself, all she's doing is, is working alongside him. I think that has rehabilitated him and he will, when the time comes, be accepted as monarch. Yeah, I think he has become a bit more popular because I think like, you know, in some ways he was ahead of the curve when it comes to like climate change, you know, or, you know, like looking at organic food and all that kind of stuff. I also understand that maybe the negative publicity about the whole thing that happened with this particularly volatile relationship between him and Diana and then the whole affair. At some point, you know, like public memory is so short, like, you know, people forget all these things, people move on. The whole story of Diana is, it, it, I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting story and it's not clear cut. But Diana fundamentally went into that marriage with Charles, a damaged woman. She'd had a very difficult childhood. Her mother and father had had a, a bad marriage. Her mother was an abused wife. She desperately hung on in the marriage until she had produced a son and heir for her husband. She then fell in love with somebody and saw a means of, of escape and a new life. She had every intention of taking her children with her when she left Diana's father. Diana was only six at that time. She had two older sisters and a younger brother. In the custody proceedings after the divorce, Diana's grandmother gave evidence against her, her, her own daughter in a court of law, calling her a bad mother. And as a result, very unusual for the early 1960s, but as a result, her mother uh, lost custody of all four of her children. Now, Diana had no idea what was going on in, in the law courts. All Diana, age six, knew was that her mother didn't love her enough to take her with her. She felt unloved and unwanted, and that little girl took that hurt and that feeling of rejection and misery with her into her adult years. When she met the Prince of Wales, he was desperate to find a bride. The press were on his back, his father was on his back, he was in his early 30s, and if a, an heir to the throne has one duty in life, it is to ensure the succession and marry and produce an heir. 
So there was a lot of pressure on him. He had at that time to marry a member of the aristocracy, it seemed important, a member of the aristocracy, a member of the Church of England, and a virgin. Now by the 1980s, those three things were like hen's teeth. We'd had the sexual revolution of the 60s, we'd had the contraceptive pill. There were very few virgins around, let alone aristocratic ones and members of the Church of England. So along came Diana, who appeared to be absolutely everything Charles was looking for. And Diana was very clever. I think she had set her sights on the Prince of Wales years before when she was a teenager, an earlier, younger teenager, and had been going out, and Charles had been going out with her older sister. She came to a shooting party at Althrop, the country house they lived in. I think this teenage Diana fell for, for Charles and dreamt, back in her boarding school, dreamt about one day being his girlfriend. So when she met Charles, she pressed all the right buttons and she told him how sad she thought he'd looked at Earl Mountbatten's funeral. And she touched him. She was very pretty, she was very innocent, she was very sweet, she was very funny. She made everybody laugh. He invited her to come up to Balmoral. She went, it went wonderfully. Everybody loved her. She seemed to love Balmoral. She seemed to love being outside. And, and they had a wonderful time and Charles began to think that this might be a, a possible bride for him. As the months went by, you know, they saw one another, but they saw one another a handful of times. And the press got onto her immediately. During that holiday in Balmoral, a photographer was on the banks of the River Dee, spotted her, worked out who she was, and the press were then en masse outside her flat in London. And every time she left her flat, they charged after her. Her life became absolutely miserable. The long and the short of it is that Charles's father, unhappily they don't speak in the way that most families speak. They, they write memos to one another. His father wrote Charles a memo saying, you've got to make your mind up about this girl. Either ask her to marry you or let her go because you are going to damage her reputation if this continues. Charles misread the memo, misunderstood it, thought his father was telling him that he should marry this girl and asked Diana to marry him. It was too early for either of them to have any idea whether this was the right thing. He, he felt that he could fall in love with her. He felt that she had everything that was necessary. She was an aristocrat, she was a virgin, she was a member of the Church of England. And furthermore, because her father, Earl Spencer, had been an equerry to the Queen, and to the Queen's father, she understood the protocol of royalty. She'd been around the royal family, so she wasn't phased by them. It seemed a perfect match, and she seemed to love everything that he loved. But the reality was she didn't love everything he loved. She was a damaged woman who was trying to be loved. I think if you're going through something like that, you know, especially when you're, it's related to the death of your mother and, you know, the fact that she was chased into a tunnel by the paparazzi because it was a media hungry moment. Whether the press killed his mother or not is as much of a conspiracy as who killed her or not. I don't know. It's, a, it's only speculation, but I would, I would say there's, yeah, there's definitely a lot that goes on around around the royal family that we just have no idea about and uh, I mean they're the most powerful family in the country and the aristocracy in the UK is like <laughs> it's very powerful and there's definitely a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that we don't know about. Yeah I mean you know I hear all sorts of things I wasn't there I mean you, there are so many different speculations it's very hard to have any kind of belief as such because you know there hasn't been any formal review of the whole thing in any way whatsoever. There hasn't really been anybody coming out speaking about it strongly being a conspiracy in one way or the other. It has just been different rumors as such. So, I mean, it is possible, but I mean, I haven't really seen anything to say definitely this is something that makes me think or suspect one way or the other. I 
don't think the royal family would have taken a hit out on her because that's a bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, no, I don't believe in that. When we were young, we all we all fancied like a Prince William because he was super hot. But you know, <laughs> it was obviously these things have changed when I've lived here over a period of time because I also feel like. I guess waste of public money on a lot of things. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess maybe living here has changed my opinion, but it was a different thing, I guess, when I was living in India. I used to go to school here when I was a teenager in Cambridge. And I think that's where I became more aware of the royal family as such. And, and yeah, I, I always followed them. I like to see what's what's going on. I don't think they have been doing anything particularly different over a period of years in terms of what they do for the country. How they're perceived overseas has probably changed because uh, the younger generations want to live their lives a little bit differently than perhaps um, those of the Queen's generation. And that brings with it more opinions from others who perhaps view any royal family as being very traditional, but these younger people perhaps want to live their lives a little bit differently. I think there is no chance that, that Queen Elizabeth will abdicate. When she became queen, she vowed she would serve this country her life long, be it short or long. As long as she has her health and her mental capacity, which at the moment both are absolutely robust, she, she will remain as queen. Years ago, the Dutch queen abdicated and one of the Queen's private secretaries said to her, Ma'am, the Dutch Queen has abdicated. And the Queen scoffed and said, Typical Dutch. <laughs> um, this is not something that she will do. And it's not something I think that the Prince of Wales would want her to do. I mean, sure, he's been waiting a very long time to become king, but he hasn't been twiddling his thumbs. He's been doing some extraordinary work during his years in waiting. And when he does come to the throne, he will be the best prepared monarch that this country has ever had. He may not be young, but he's got plenty of energy still, plenty of get up and go, plenty of ideas, and huge dedication. And, you know, look at his family. His father is still going and he's 98. His mother is still going and she's 93, turning 94 shortly. He could have a good few years ahead of him. I think he will make a big contribution as king. I, I don't think that's the case. I, I, you know, if she abdicates, I don't think it would be for very long anyway. Um, and I think if Charles takes over, probably for a short period of time anyway, he's probably my age as well. So. Um, I think it'll be for a short period. Who knows? I think maybe he might stay for a while and then hand over to Prince William. Complicated. I mean, I, I really like Queen Elizabeth, actually. I didn't care for the monarchy at all before I moved here and I've become fond, so um, just on a very passing level. The Queen. I think she's a wonderful, wonderful person. Very royal, <laughs> very thoughtful very dignified, very difficult life for her, I think. I think she's, yeah, she's wonderful. I think she's going to stay on forever, really, as long as uh, she's alive. I think that's her view. I think her son Charles has uh, pretty much given up on the job, I think. Only in sort of the fact that, like, as a figurehead, I don't think she should have any sort of powers. I mean, it's very li little powers that she has, really, and it's more sort of ceremonial. But yeah, I mean, really, I think the way that the UK Parliament as well is is set up with the House of Lords and etc. Should be reformed, um, and definitely having the Queen as like the sort of figurehead of that should really change. I think the Queen, yes, uh, obviously is is the most important person of the royal family, and is an absolutely wonderful figurehead for this country. And for her, it's been a sense of duty, maybe to her father, but also to her country. And she's done a wonderful job thus far, I would say. And she's dedicated so much of her life to that. She's gone through war. She's gone through political unrest. Well, I mean, she's going to go for the record on, on, on why, why not? I mean, she's always been the one who sent telegrams around for people that reach 100 as such. So there's hope for all of us. But I mean, you know, she will go for the record of being um, 
the longest running monarch. I think she'll do that at least um, before she ever considers abdicating because there afterwards, you know, there'll be a certain mark that she's left, but she'll certainly go that long. So, and so long as she's capable of doing the job and also being able to delegate the other royals to cover a lot of her duties. I mean, you know, her husband is no longer um, formally involved in royal duties, but at the end of the day, she certainly knows how to arrange all the other members that work with her. And that is a whole transition process that's taking place, whoever will be the next in line. I mean, fair play to her. She's 93 and she's still managing. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't even, like, I struggle with social events, like, sometimes. And I can't believe, like, she's actually, like, being able to, like, even manage all of that. So, you know, amazing that she is being able to do that. I, I think she's done a grand job, like, the whole time she's been there. And I really don't see... Uh, I think she's quite in touch. I don't think she is out of touch, really. Um, I think because she does surround herself with, and is very close to William and stuff like that, she she doesn't kind of seem out of touch to me. And I think there'll be the right time for him to come in and take that, and that will be his proper time to do it. I think while she's still in power, why should she kind of uh, you know abdicate that and let that go? I don't think it's all that important, really, who's who's the head of the monarchy. I don't think it's all that important for the running of the country. If you look at other monarchies in Europe, you can see that they are far more progressive and maybe that's something that should happen here as well for the younger generation to more accept them and their monarchy becoming more part of the society. She's been, she's done her duty, she's worked very very hard and if she feels that that there should be a change, which she may not but on the other hand who knows, I think that's the right time to do it. I think the, the Queen, I think, is 93 and, and in remarkable health and continuing to do her, her, her duties the best she can. And I think while she's able to do that, I, I think she should stay where she is. Interestingly, the, I heard recently that um, Charles is like the second most favourite uh, member of the royal family now. So he's gone in people's estimations. But uh, obviously the, the, the Queen is from good stock. I think her mother lived to 100, 102. So you can see the same happening with the Queen, but I think and until she's um, not as fit and well as what she is now, I, I think absolutely continue and uh, hopefully uh, get a few more years. Because Elizabeth is quite old now, I think it would be good to have a youthful face for the monarchy. That might help. But I also think that Prince Charles has done a lot, a lot for the environment, a lot for young men's youth involvement, um, a lot for the arts. I wouldn't mind seeing Prince Charles as monarch, and I think that what he would do for the environment would be really, really interesting. She, at the end of the day, can't necessarily decide whether he's fit to be the king or not, unless she is planning to abdicate, which is not what's within her plan. When she dies one day, then obviously he is the heir to the throne. So he, he needs to be prepared either way, and he knew that and everybody's known that um, ever since he's been born. So I think there's still a future, but the problem's going to be with Charles. I think if Charles becomes king, it, the royal um, people will not be so favourable with the royal. Like I say, I think the Americans following the monarchy as a soap opera is a little bit confusing to me, but I was very, in a very visceral gut level as an American, um, quite opposed to monarchy. And then a lot of my previous research has been on Spain, and so I. I don't care for their monarchy. So when I came here, I was I was kind of on that same line of thinking. Now I think that there's a in a in a very controlled constitutional monarchy sense, there's a there's a continuity that can be provided through a monarchy that's interesting. I don't think it would necessarily work anywhere else, but it seems to work fairly well here. I think it's a bit unclear what the future is. I think there's so much uh, in the tabloids and the papers and, and scandals and stuff at the moment. Uh, I think they've always dealt with previous ones quite well. Um, yeah, I think they'll still be around for us. And I think, you know, that it's, like I said, it's an important part of our country to have the monarchy, uh, in my opinion. You know, I mean, nobody's beyond criticism, but I mean, I wouldn't say that a criticism has to go as far as deciding whether we should have a monarchy or not because, I mean, you know, it's part of this society, it's also part of the way the democracy works.